Hi, welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Mike Parker, and since 2008, it's been my privilege to be the instructor for this class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures, teachings, and history of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Time and location are available on the class website. There's a link to that in the show notes just below this video. Also on the class website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for the content on these sites. What you're about to see is a recording of my notes for one of the lessons. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And please feel free to subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. My friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and the authority and keys that he held are now vested in the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And most importantly, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. I hope you enjoy this lesson. This week, we'll be discussing the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. We'll focus particularly on the loss of the 116 page manuscript of the Book of Lehi, how the translation was accomplished, and the calling of three witnesses to testify of the work. As will be the case with many lessons in this course, there's too much for us to cover in just this single class session. The best we can do is provide an overview of key events and discuss some passages in the revelations Joseph Smith received during that time. Let's begin with some historical background. On 22nd September, 1827, Joseph Smith obtained the gold plates four years after the angel Moroni first appeared to him. Several weeks later, Joseph received the breastplate with the interpreters, later called Urm and Thummim. He had to continually move the plates from one hiding place to another to prevent them from being stolen by people in the Palmyra area who had heard that he had them and were determined to get them from him. To escape ongoing persecution, in early December 1827, Joseph and his wife Emma, who was three months pregnant at the time, moved from the Smith family home in Manchester, New York, to the home of Emma's parents, Isaac and Elizabeth Hale, in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Joseph and Emma soon had their own modest home on a property that adjoined her parents' farm. Between December 1827 and February 1828, Joseph took the first tentative steps of copying characters from the plates and translating some of them. On the 2nd of February, 1828, Martin Harris arrived in Harmony. 44-year-old Martin Harris was a prominent resident of Palmyra who had known Joseph for several years and believed in his calling. Two days after he came to Harmony, Martin departed for New York City by way of Albany. The purpose of his trip was to show some of the characters Joseph had transcribed to three individuals who had expertise in Egyptian and Native American studies. His third and final meeting was with Professor Charles Anthon. Anthon was, at that time, a 30-year-old assistant professor of Greek and Latin at Columbia College. He had been collecting American Indian stories and speeches for publication and was eager to inspect the document Martin brought him. Martin Harris's account of what happened at that meeting differs from the version of events that Charles Anthon later reported. Whatever took place between them, though, Martin was satisfied with the answer he received. When he returned to Harmony on the 12th of April, 1828, 
he immediately began to serve as Joseph's scribe in the Book of Mormon translation effort. The translation began with Mormon's abridgment of the record of Nephi and his descendants. Between April and June 1828, Joseph and Martin completed 116 manuscript pages in 63 days, nearly two written pages per day. Joseph called this record the Book of Lehi. Martin pleaded with Joseph to ask the Lord for permission to take the manuscript to Palmyra so he could show it to his wife, Lucy, who was skeptical of the whole affair. Joseph asked the Lord three times for permission for Martin to take the manuscript. The first two times, the Lord's answer was no. On Joseph's third request, the Lord granted his permission on the condition that Martin would show the manuscript only to members of his immediate family. On the 15th of June, 1828, Martin left Harmony for Palmyra with the 116 manuscript pages. Joseph gave the Nephite interpreters to the angel Moroni until the manuscript was returned. On that same day, Emma gave birth to her first child, a son, who died soon after he was born. After not receiving any word from Martin for nearly three weeks, Joseph left for Palmyra on the 8th of July, 1828. He arrived on the 15th of July and learned that the entire manuscript had been lost. On the 16th of July, 1828, after, quote, pouring out my soul in supplication to the Lord that if possible, I might obtain mercy at hands and be forgiven of all that I had done, which was contrary to his will, unquote, Joseph received an angelic visitation and the revelation that is now canonized as Doctrine and Covenants section three. This revelation was given through the Nephite interpreters, which were returned to Joseph briefly, after which they and the plates were taken from him by Moroni. This was one of the lowest points in the prophet's life. He had lost the manuscript of the book of Lehi, lost the plates, the interpreters, and the gift to translate, lost his firstborn child, and he had nearly lost Emma in a difficult childbirth. DNC 3, verses 3 through 4 and 9 through 11. Quote, remember, remember that it is not the work of God that is frustrated, but the work of men. For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. Behold, thou art Joseph, and thou wast chosen to do the work of the Lord. But because of transgression, if thou art not aware, thou wilt fall. But remember, God is merciful. Therefore, repent of that which thou hast done, which is contrary to the commandment which I gave you, and thou art still chosen, and art again called to the work. Except thou do this, thou shalt be delivered up and become as other men and have no more gift." Unquote. The first canonized revelation in this dispensation began with the Lord instructing the prophet on the importance of humility. When we think we can do just fine on our own or that we know better than the Lord does, we set ourselves up for a big fall. In the revelations he received, Joseph was repeatedly warned that he was not irreplaceable. He needed to be told early and often that he was doing the Lord's work, not his own work. That Joseph published the revelations in which the Lord chastened him is evidence of the authenticity of his calling. The rules that apply to members of the Lord's church apply to all, up to and including the Lord's prophet all are bound by the commandments of God. By contrast, many of history's false prophets have claimed to be exempt from the rules that govern their followers. For example, David Koresh of Waco's Branch Davidian sect demanded sexual abstinence from his followers, while he himself had sexual relations with multiple women in his group. FLDS leader Warren Jeffs lived a much more opulent lifestyle than his followers, 
and he alone was free to watch television and use the internet. When he was apprehended by law enforcement outside Las Vegas in August 2006, he was wearing shorts and a short sleeve t-shirt, unlike the rest of his followers who were required to wear pioneer style clothing that went to the wrists and the ankles. Over two months after the sacred objects had been taken from him, Joseph Smith told his mother, quote, I had the joy and satisfaction of again receiving the ermine thummim into my possession, and I have commenced translating, and Emma writes for me now. But the angel said that the Lord would send someone to write for me, and I trust that it will be so." Unquote. On or about 22nd of September, 1828, Joseph received the revelation that is now Doctrine and Covenants section 10, or at least the first part of it. In the past, there was some confusion about the date when section 10 was received. Latter-day Saint historians have recently determined that the opening part of section 10 was received in 1828, while the latter portion was received in May 1829. The section heading in the 2013 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants reflects this. DNC 10 verses 1 through 5. Quote, now, behold, I say unto you, that because you delivered up those writings which you had power given unto you to translate by the means of the Urm and Thummim into the hands of a wicked man, you have lost them. And you also lost your gift at the same time, and your mind became darkened. Nevertheless, it is now restored unto you again. Therefore, See that you are faithful and continue on unto the finishing of the remainder of the work of translation as you have begun. Do not run faster or labor more than you have strength and means provided to enable you to translate, but be diligent unto the end. Pray always that you may come off conqueror, yea, that ye may conquer Satan, and that you may escape the hands of the servants of Satan that do uphold his work. In this passage, the Lord gave Joseph divine counsel to help him succeed in his calling, encouraging him to be faithful, to not run faster or labor more than you have strength, and to pray always. The commandment to pray always appears 11 times in the Doctrine and Covenants, which underscores the importance of this commandment. The Lord also warned Joseph in this revelation that the individuals who had obtained the manuscript intended to alter it in the hopes of exposing Joseph as a fraud if he retranslated the lost pages. The Lord had long ago prepared for this event, however, and he had arranged for a divine replacement for the lost material. The Prophet Mormon used several records as the source for his own plates of Mormon. He abridged the large plates of Nephi, the secular record created by Nephi and handed down through the lineage of the kings. The large plates contained an account of the reign of the kings and the wars and contentions of Nephi's people from the time of Lehi down to Mormon's own time. After Mormon abridged that record, the Holy Spirit prompted him to look through the other records he had in his collection. He found another set of plates created by Nephi, the small plates of Nephi, which contained an account of Nephi's ministry, the scriptures, and what Nephi called the things of my soul. Nephi handed down the small plates through the lineage of the prophets. He commanded them to only record preaching which was sacred, or revelation which was great, or prophesying on these plates. These plates had a spiritual record from the time of Lehi down to the reign of King Benjamin. Nephi wrote, quote, The Lord hath commanded me to make these small plates for a wise purpose in him, which purpose I know not." Unquote. Mormon inserted the small plates of Nephi into his own record without abridging them. He wrote that he did this, quote, for a wise purpose, for thus it whispereth me according to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord, unquote. But he didn't know exactly why the Spirit prompted him to do this. Nearly 1,500 years later, the purpose for inserting the small plates of Nephi was finally revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith. DNC 10 verses 38 to 42 and 45, quote, And now verily I say unto you, 
that an account of those things that you have written, which have gone out of your hands, is engraven upon the large plates of Nephi. Yea, and you remember that it was said in those writings that a more particular account was given of these things upon the small plates of Nephi. And now, because the account which is engraven upon the small plates of Nephi is more particular concerning the things which, in my wisdom, I would bring to the knowledge of the people in this account, therefore you shall translate the engravings which are on the small plates of Nephi down even till you come to the reign of King Benjamin, or until you come to that which you have translated, which you have retained. And behold, you shall publish it as the record of Nephi, and thus I will confound those who have altered my words. Behold, there are many things engraven upon the small plates of Nephi, which do throw greater views upon my gospel. Therefore, it is wisdom in me that you should translate this first part of the engravings of Nephi and send forth in this work." Unquote. Joseph Smith and Martin Harris began by translating the book of Lehi, Mormon's abridgment of the large plates of Nephi from the time of Lehi to King Benjamin. They completed 116 manuscript pages, which Martin Harris lost. When Joseph resumed translating, he continued with Mormon's abridgment of the book of Mosiah through the book of Moroni. After that, he translated the small plates of Nephi, which contained the books of first Nephi through the words of Mormon. The small plates of Nephi were the providential replacement for the material in the missing manuscript. We were given the better account, the things of Nephi's soul, and the preaching which was sacred, and revelation which was great, and prophesying. In his revelation to Joseph, the Lord also explained his reasons for bringing forth the Book of Mormon. D&C 10, verses 52 to 56, quote, And now, behold, according to their faith in their prayers, will I bring this part of my gospel to the knowledge of my people. Behold, I do not bring it to destroy that which they have received, but to build it up. And for this cause have I said, if this generation harden not their hearts, I will establish my church among them. Now, I do not say this to destroy my church, but I say this to build up my church. Therefore, whosoever belongeth to my church need not fear, for such shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. But it is they who do not fear me, neither keep my commandments, but build up churches unto themselves to get gain, yea, and all those that do wickedly, and build up the kingdom of the devil. Yea, verily, verily, I say unto you, that it is they that I will disturb, and cause to tremble, and shake to the center." Unquote. This revelation was received 16 months before Joseph Smith organized the Lord's Restored Church, so what could the Lord have meant by, I do not say this to destroy my church, but to build up my church? BYU professor Stephen C. Harper commented, quote, Doctrine and Covenants 10 gives us Christ's embracing view of Christianity. The restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ is the redemption of all of Christianity. Someone who restores an old house preserves all that is good and wonderful in it, while fixing and renewing what is broken or missing. Verse 55 is meant to ease the fears of all Christians concerning the restored church. The only ones who need fear are those who build their own churches, those who are Christian in name, but whose hearts are far from Christ. He is not destroying the true church, he is building it. This is good news for all followers of Christ." Unquote. The true Church of Christ had been lost and obscured by apostasy. Joseph Smith wasn't called to tear down all the old systems and start over from scratch. He embraced existing truth, fixed things that were wrong, and added new truths. Whosoever belongeth to my church, then, refers to those who are part of the Church of the Lamb of God, about which Nephi wrote, quote, Behold, there are saved two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God, and the other is the church of the devil." Unquote. They are all those who love and serve God and seek to do his will.
In late October 1828, Joseph recommenced translating the Book of Mormon, starting with the Book of Mosiah, with Emma serving as scribe. The translation proceeded slowly at this point. I'd like to pause here for a moment and discuss how the Book of Mormon was translated. Traditionally, when we think of Joseph Smith translating the Book of Mormon, we picture images like these. Joseph sitting at a table with a scribe, the gold plates open in front of him, his finger tracing the engravings as he dictated. However, this is a romanticized or idealized version of the translation process. These paintings have taken artistic license in depicting the event. Among all the first-hand accounts of the translation process left by those who actually witnessed it, not one person described it this way. Joseph himself was hesitant to describe the exact process by which the translation was done. The most he ever said was, quote, through the medium of the Urm and Thummim, I translated the record by the gift and power of God, unquote. In 1831, he was invited at a conference of the church to explain more fully how the Book of Mormon came forth. The minutes record, quote, Brother Joseph Smith Jr. said, that it was not intended to tell the world all the particulars of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and also said that it was not expedient for him to relate these things, etc." Unquote. We can, however, glean some understanding from the statements made by individuals who saw or participated in the translation process. When Joseph translated, he either used the Nephite interpreters Moroni gave him, or he used a seer stone that he had obtained several years earlier. Joseph described the Nephite interpreters as consisting of two transparent stones set in the rim of a bow fastened to a breastplate. Martin Harris gave a detailed description of them. Quote, the two stones set in a bow of silver were about two inches in diameter, perfectly round, and about five eighths of an inch thick at the center but not so thick at the edges where they came into the bow. They were joined by a round bar of silver, about three eighths of an inch in diameter and about four inches long, which with the two stones would make eight inches. The stones were white, like polished marble, with a few gray streaks." Unquote. Lucy Mack Smith, the prophet's mother, held this instrument while it was wrapped in a silk handkerchief. She later wrote that, quote, it consisted of two smooth three-cornered diamonds set in glass, and the glass was set in silver bows connected with each other in the same way that old-fashioned spectacles are made, unquote. In an 1891 interview, William Smith, the prophet's brother, indicated that when Joseph used the interpreters, his hands were free to hold the plates. These images show what the interpreters and breastplate might have looked like and how Joseph may have used them. Joseph also used a seer stone to translate. Martin Harris recalled that Joseph found this stone while digging a well on the property of Mason Chase and that by using it, he was able to find things that were hidden or lost. As we discussed in lesson two, Joseph had the ability to find hidden things with this stone, and knowledge of his gift spread widely in the area around Palmyra. David Whitmer, Emma Smith, Martin Harris, and other eyewitnesses to the translation of the Book of Mormon testified that Joseph often used his seer stone in translating the Book of Mormon. David Whitmer gave the following description of the manner in which the Book of Mormon was translated. Quote, Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat and put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light. And in the darkness, the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and on that appeared the writing. One character at a time would appear, and under it was the interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery, who was his principal scribe, and when it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear, and another character with the interpretation would appear. Thus, the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God, 
and not by any power of man. Unquote. Only a few months before her death in 1879, Emma Smith recalled, quote, I frequently wrote day after day, often sitting at the table close by Joseph, he sitting with his face buried in his hat with the stone in it and dictating hour after hour with nothing between us, Unquote. Edward Stevenson interviewed Martin Harris in 1870 and reported the following, quote, Martin Harris said that the prophet possessed a seer stone by which he was enabled to translate as well as from the Urman Thummim, and for convenience he then used the seer stone. Martin explained the translation as follows. By aid of the seer stone, sentences would appear and were read by the prophet and written by Martin, and when finished he would say, written, and if correctly written, that sentence would disappear and another appear in its place, but if not written correctly, it remained until corrected. Martin said, after continued translation, they would become weary and would go down to the river and exercise by throwing stones out on the river, etc. While so doing, on one occasion, Martin found a stone very much resembling the one used for translating, and on resuming their labor of translation, Martin put in place the stone that he had found. He said that the prophet remained silent unusually and intently gazing in darkness, no traces of the usual sentences appearing. Much surprised, Joseph exclaimed, Martin, what is the matter? All is as dark as Egypt. Martin's countenance betrayed him, and the prophet asked Martin why he had done so. Martin said to stop the mouths of fools who had told him that the prophet had learned those sentences and was merely repeating them, etc. Unquote. These drawings are possible representations of Joseph Smith's translation process. The photograph of the table with the manuscript, the white hat, and the plates wrapped in a tablecloth is on display in the newly rebuilt home of Joseph and Emma Smith at the Priesthood Restoration Site in Pennsylvania. Eyewitness testimony suggests that Joseph used both the Nephite interpreters and the seer stone interchangeably to suit his needs as he translated. Joseph also typically didn't have the plates open in front of him during translation. They were instead usually wrapped in a tablecloth or sometimes even in another room while he worked. William W. Phelps was the first person to identify the interpreters as the Urim and Thummim mentioned in the Old Testament. By early 1833, Joseph Smith and his associates began using the biblical term Urim and Thummim to refer to any stones used to receive divine revelations, including both the Nephite interpreters and the single seer stone. When Joseph Smith first received the plates and the interpreters in 1827, Joseph Knight Sr. was visiting the Smith family in Manchester. He later related the following conversation, quote, after breakfast, Joseph Smith called me into the other room and he set his foot on the bed and leaned his head on his hand and says, well, I am disappointed. Well, say I, I am sorry. Well, says he, I am greatly disappointed. It is 10 times better than I expected. Then he went on to tell the length and width and thickness of the plates and said he, they appear to be gold but he seemed to think more of the glasses or the urm and thummim than he did of the plates. For, says he, I can see anything. They are marvelous." Unquote. From this, I gather that the Nephite interpreters were somehow more powerful or effective in Joseph's hands than the seer stone he already had. Ultimately, what is the difference between a seer stone and urm and thummim? There isn't one, they're the same thing. Physical objects used to aid in receiving revelation from God. What one calls these objects depends on how one views the user and his profession. To Joseph's critics, he was using a peep stone to pretend to search for treasure and to defraud his gullible followers. To those who gained a testimony of Joseph as a prophet, he was using Urm and Thummim, spoken of in scripture, 
to receive divine revelation. Finally, the late historian and BYU professor Richard Lloyd Anderson had some important thoughts on the subject. He wrote, quote, there are many questions that we cannot answer from the evidence we have at this time. Exactly how, for example, does the Urim and Thummim work? Was there a basis of truth behind David Whitmer's viewpoint that writing appeared on the interpreters? Or did the stones somehow focus the thought of the translator? Or did the stones serve to confirm translation? These things the Lord has not revealed to the church at large, and the answer must remain, we don't know." Unquote. Oliver Cowdery, a 22-year-old school teacher from Vermont, contracted to teach at the Stafford House School in Manchester Township, New York, on the 25th of November, 1828. During his 16-week stay, he boarded with the Joseph Smith senior family and learned of the gold plates and Joseph Jr.'s efforts to translate them. By early March, 1829, Joseph and Emma had completed only a few pages of the Book of Mormon translation. It had been eight months since Martin Harris had lost the manuscript of the Book of Lehi. Joseph and Martin had not met since that time. Back in Palmyra, Martin's wife Lucy was stirring up opposition to Joseph Smith and had filed a complaint with a magistrate in Lyons, New York. Martin came back to Harmony seeking a greater witness of the plates. At this time, Joseph received a revelation in which he was told, this generation shall have my word through you, and was also commanded to stop translating for a season. In this revelation, Joseph also received the promise that there would be others who would testify of the Book of Mormon. DNC 5, verses 11 through 15, quote, And in addition to your testimony, the testimony of three of my servants, whom I shall call and ordain, unto whom I will show these things, and they shall go forth with my words that are given through you. Yea, they shall know of a surety that these things are true, for from heaven will I declare it unto them. I will give them power that they may behold and view these things as they are, and to none else will I grant this power to receive this same testimony among this generation, in this the beginning of the rising up and coming forth of my church out of the wilderness, clear as the moon, and fair as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. And the testimony of three witnesses will I send forth of my word." Unquote. The Book of Mormon itself also mentions that there would be three witnesses who would testify of its truth and divinity, but Joseph hadn't translated these portions of the record yet. This was the first revelation given to Joseph concerning other witnesses of the Book of Mormon. According to these verses, the three witnesses would possess at least five unique characteristics. First, the Lord would call and ordain them. Second, they would know of a surety that these things are true. Third, the Lord would declare this knowledge unto them from heaven. Fourth, the Lord would give them power that they may behold and view these things, meaning the gold plates. Fifth, none else would be granted this power to receive this same testimony. Joseph was also informed in the revelation that Martin Harris would be one of the three witnesses. Why Martin, after all the mistakes he had made and poor judgment he had demonstrated? The Lord had even called Martin wicked three times in revelations given to Joseph. Recall the Lord's words to Joseph the previous summer that we read earlier, quote, but remember God is merciful. Therefore, repent of that which thou hast done, which is contrary to the commandment which I gave you, and thou art still chosen, and art again called to the work." Unquote. The revelation in section 5 is an example of the Lord's mercy, grace, and long-suffering. If Martin Harris, despite all his failings, could still be called as one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon, certainly we can find forgiveness and restoration despite our failings. This revelation also declares that those who believe in the Book of Mormon will receive a, quote, manifestation of God's spirit 
and they shall be born of me, even of water and of the Spirit. Unquote. This revelation was received before Joseph translated the promise found in Moroni chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. So section 5 would be, chronologically, the first indication to Joseph Smith that an individual could gain a spiritual witness of the truth of the Book of Mormon and the restored gospel. Oliver Cowdery and Samuel Smith arrived in Harmony, Pennsylvania on the 5th of April, 1829. Two days after their arrival, Joseph recommenced the translation of the Book of Mormon, with Oliver serving as his scribe. They translated from the Book of Mosiah to the Book of Moroni, then translated the material on the small plates of Nephi, 1st Nephi through Words of Mormon. Virtually all of the existing translation of the Book of Mormon was completed in less than 65 working days, between the 7th of April and the 30th of June, 1829. That works out to over eight of our printed pages per day. During this time, Joseph also received and recorded 12 revelations. Along with Oliver Cowdery, received the Aaronic Priesthood from John the Baptist. Made a two-day journey to Colesville, New York, a round-trip journey of approximately 60 miles, or 97 kilometers. Baptized Samuel Smith, moved from Harmony, Pennsylvania to Fayette, New York to complete the translation at the home of Peter Whitmer Sr., a one-way journey of over 100 miles or 160 kilometers. Baptized Peter Whitmer Sr. and three of his sons, traveled from Fayette to Palmyra to register the copyright of the Book of Mormon, a round-trip journey of 62 miles or 100 kilometers. Oliver wrote the Articles of the Church of Christ, a document similar to what became Doctrine and Covenant section 20. The angel Moroni showed the plates and other sacred items to the three witnesses, and Joseph Smith showed the plates to the eight witnesses. About the 22nd of June, 1829, Joseph received a revelation directed to Martin Harris, Oliver Cowdery, and David Whitmer. This revelation is now section 17 of the Doctrine and Covenants. This revelation was probably received just after Joseph translated 2 Nephi chapter 27, which revealed that there would be three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. The Lord had already indicated that Oliver, David, and Martin might be witnesses to the book's divinity. These three men repeatedly asked Joseph to inquire of the Lord if they could be the three witnesses spoken of in the Book of Mormon. Joseph recalled, quote, At length I complied, and through the Urm and Thummim, I obtained of the Lord for them the following revelation. Unquote. D and C 17, verses 1 through 6. Quote, Behold, I say unto you, that you must rely upon my word, which if you do with full purpose of heart, you shall have a view of the plates, and also of the breastplate, the sword of Laban, the Urm and Thummim, which were given to the brother of Jared upon the mount when he talked with the Lord face to face, and the miraculous directors which were given to Lehi while in the wilderness on the borders of the Red Sea. And it is by your faith that you shall obtain a view of them, even by that faith which was had by the prophets of old. And after that you have obtained faith and have seen them with your eyes, you shall testify of them by the power of God, and this you shall do, that my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., may not be destroyed, that I may bring about my righteous purposes unto the children of men in this work. And ye shall testify that you have seen them, even as my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., has seen them. For it is by my power that he has seen them, and it is because he had faith. And he has translated the book, even that part which I have commanded him. And as your Lord and your God liveth, it is true." Unquote. This revelation indicated that the three witnesses would view five sacred items, the plates of Mormon, the breastplate, the sword of Laban, the Urm and Thummim, that is to say the Nephite interpreters, and the miraculous directors, or Leahona. Why not just the plates? 
Why the other items as well? Possibly to show that A, the plates were translated by divine power represented in the breastplate and interpreters, and B, the Book of Mormon isn't fiction. It's a historical record of an actual people represented in the plates, the Sword of Laban and the Leahona. In this revelation, the Lord commanded the three witnesses to testify of what they saw, and the Lord himself testified of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. The fulfillment of the Lord's promise came near the end of June, 1829. Joseph, Martin, Oliver, and David retired to a secluded spot in a pasture on the Whitmer farm in Fayette, New York. After each man had prayed aloud in turn twice, Martin Harris separated himself from the others, believing himself to be the reason they had not received a divine manifestation. Joseph recalled, quote, Martin accordingly withdrew from us, and we knelt down again, and had not been many minutes engaged in prayer, when presently we beheld a light above us in the air of exceeding brightness, and behold, an angel stood before us." Unquote. David Whitmer testified of what he experienced. Quote, we not only saw the plates of the Book of Mormon, but also the brass plates, the plates of the Book of Ether, and many other plates. The fact is, it was just as though Joseph, Oliver, and I were sitting just here on a log when we were overshadowed by a light. It was not the light of the sun, nor like that of fire, but more glorious and beautiful. It extended away round us. I cannot tell how far, but in the midst of this light, about as far off as he sits, pointing to his nephew, John C. Whitmer, sitting a few feet from him, there appeared, as it were, a table with many records or plates upon it, besides the plates of the Book of Mormon, also the Sword of Laban, the directors, that is to say the ball which Lehi had, and the interpreters. I saw them just as plain as I see this bed, striking the bed beside him with his hand, and I heard the voice of the Lord as distinctly as I ever heard anything in my life, declaring that the records of the plates of the Book of Mormon were translated by the gift and power of God. Unquote. Joseph then left Oliver and David to look for Martin Harris. He found Martin engaged in prayer, as he had previously been instructed by the Lord. After joining him in prayer, Joseph and Martin saw the heavens opened, and they received the same vision that David and Oliver had had. Martin, who had long sought for a witness of the truth of Joseph's claims, cried out in joy, "'Tis enough, tis enough." Mine eyes have beheld, mine eyes have beheld. Joseph's mother recalled that this event took place in a grove a short distance from the Whitmer farmhouse in Fayette, New York. The four men left the house in the morning after breakfast and a prayer service. They returned to the house between three and four o'clock in the afternoon. Even leaving time for preparatory prayer and subsequent discussion, the vision would have lasted four to six hours. After this, Joseph expressed his relief to his mother at no longer being the only one to carry the burden of knowing and testifying. Quote, Father, mother, said he, you do not know how happy I am. The Lord has caused the plates to be shown to three more besides me who have also seen an angel and will have to testify to the truth of what I have said. For they know for themselves that I do not go about to deceive the people and I do feel as though I was relieved of a dreadful burden, which was almost too much for me to endure. But they will now have to bear a part, and it does rejoice my soul that I am not any longer to be entirely alone in the world." Unquote. The testimony of the three witnesses has been published in every authorized edition of the Book of Mormon since 1830. Other than the personal witness of the Holy Ghost, the testimony of the three witnesses is the most powerful evidence that Joseph Smith obtained the gold plates from an angel and translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. The three witnesses maintained and defended their testimonies throughout their entire lives, even though all three men had disagreements with Joseph Smith and eventually left the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Their disaffection from Joseph 
and the restored church makes their published testimonies all the more compelling. It would be much easier to criticize their witness of the Book of Mormon if they had remained close friends of Joseph Smith to the end of his life. Instead, they became estranged from him, but repeatedly and adamantly affirmed what they saw on that summer day in 1829. Because their collective witness is so strong, critics of the restored gospel have gone after them aggressively, attacking their characters and their testimonies. One popular criticism today is that the witnesses didn't have an actual physical experience, but instead they had only a vision or a spiritual experience. These critics point to the fact that Martin Harris sometimes referred to seeing the plates and the angel Moroni with a spiritual eye. Less than a year before his death, David Whitmer responded to this claim, quote, of course we were in the spirit when we had the view, for no man can behold the face of an angel except in a spiritual view, but we were in the body also, and everything was as natural to us as it is at any time. A bright light enveloped us where we were that filled at noonday, and there in a vision or in the spirit, we saw and heard just as it is stated in my testimony in the Book of Mormon." Unquote. Each of the three witnesses emphatically affirmed that their experience was real and physical. Martin Harris said, quote, gentlemen, do you see my right hand? Are you sure you see it? Are your eyes playing a trick or something? No. Well, as sure as you see my hand, so sure did I see the angel and the plates." Unquote. David Whitmer, responding to the suggestion that he had been mistaken and had simply been moved upon by some mental disturbance or hallucination which had deceived him into thinking he saw the angel in the plates, arose and drew himself up to his full height, a little over six feet, and said in solemn and impressive tones, quote, no, sir, I was not under any hallucination, nor was I deceived. I saw with these eyes, and I heard with these ears, I know whereof I speak." Unquote. Shortly before his death, Oliver Cowdery testified, quote, I wrote with my own pen the entire Book of Mormon, save a few pages, as it fell from the lips of the prophet Joseph Smith, as he translated it by the gift and power of God, by the means of the Urm and Thummim, or as it is called by that book, Holy Interpreters. I beheld with my eyes and handled with my hands the gold plates from which it was transcribed. I also saw with my eyes and handled with my hands the Holy Interpreters. That book is true. In response to the accusation that the witness's experience could be explained by juggling, meaning sleight of hand or deception, Oliver Cowdery wrote and published the following less than five months after seeing the angel Moroni and the plates, and five months before the Book of Mormon was published. Quote, it was a clear, open, beautiful day, far from any inhabitants, in a remote field, at the time we saw the record of which it has been spoken brought and laid before us by an angel, arrayed in glorious light, who descended out of the midst of heaven. Now, if this is human juggling, judge ye." Unquote. Oliver Cowdery's dying words were his testimony of the Book of Mormon. David Whitmer had his testimony inscribed as his epitaph, the record of the Jews and the record of the Nephites are one. Truth is eternal. That concludes this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download these notes and this slideshow. In the next lesson, we'll review and discuss Joseph's early revelations to Oliver Cowdery and the restoration of the Aaronic Priesthood. The reading is Doctrine and Covenants, sections 6 through 9, 
and 13. See you next week.